Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. I'd like to thank the organizers for putting together such an exciting meeting and for inviting me to talk here. Uh, I'll be talking about a paper from last May with these authors and with this title. There's no point in reading what's already on the slides. You can read it yourself. And since some of you might be as jet-lagged as I am, I thought I would start give you a way to follow this talk so that you can sleep through most of it. You should pay attention to the next slide and the last two slides and to the conclusions, and in between, you can fall asleep. So the main point of the talk, well, I'll have a bunch of things that you were taught in school which I think are incorrect, so I'll mention them. The first is only slightly incorrect. You were taught that quantum field theory is characterized by a collection of local operators and their correlation functions. Well, the local operators do not uniquely specify a quantum field theory. And I put here not original because I'm not the first to say that. Line operators are also important. A good example to keep in mind, which I'll come to again and again in the talk, is an SU2 gauge theory versus an SO3 gauge theory. Their local operators are the same, but their Wilson lines in the SU2 and in the SO3 theory are different. The SO3 theory does not have Wilson line in the fundamental representation, and the SU2 theory does. And therefore, the two theories are really distinct. So that's what I wrote here. We need additional information. The additional information is the spectrum of line operators, surface operators, Toward the end of the talk, if I have enough time, I'll also give an example of a higher dimensional operator that could be important in a theory like QCD. Another way of thinking about it is that we can take the same theory. So, so far I talked about the theory in R4 with some operators, either points or lines. Another way of thinking about it is to place the theory on a complicated four-dimensional space. For mo all of this talk, I'll be in four dimensions, so I will not say it again. So we can put the theory on a complicated, non-trivial topology and compute correlation functions. Now we don't even need to put insertions, and we can ask, how does the theory depend on the parameters of the compactification? And you can see the emergence of new parameters through the coupling to the topology of space-time. And that's not surprising, whoops, that's not surprising that we have, that we have these two views, because one way of thinking about it is that we are in flat R4, no topology in space-time, but the insertions of the points or the lines create a topology. Because we, the space-time is not R4, but it's R4 minus the lines. And we get all sorts of cycles from that. And so that's why these two different points of view are closely related. So all this is not original. So far I haven't said anything original. What will be interesting in this talk is that we will see that, st that studying these line operators in details leads to new insight about the dynamics and the phases. And just to give a teaser, I'll present a new phase in ordinary non-abelian gauge theory. Also, I'll show that the better understanding of these lines clarifies many issues in electric magnetic duality both with n equals 4 supersymmetry, n equals 2 supersymmetry, n equals 1, and even in the theory without supersymmetry at all. So this whole work really started from my attempt during the year to understand three-dimensional supersymmetric gauge theory. And we often say that by studying models in low dimensions and with supersymmetry, that we could learn something about the non-supersymmetric theory in four dimensions. So this talk will be an example where Drowning in paradoxes in three dimensions led to new insight about non-supersymmetric four-dimensional standard non-abelian gauge theory, and I'll present that. So that's the main point. Now you can let your jet, jet lag take over, and I'll start being a little bit more concrete. So concretely, we define a quantum field theory by starting from a Lie algebra. If we're a little bit more sophisticated, we have a Lie group. So that could be SUN or SUN mod ZN. And once we decided what the group is, we know what representations the particles are. And the particles are of two kinds. Number one, we can have dynamical particles. These are the fields in the theory, various excitations that actually exist in the spectrum. And number two, these are probe particles. They are not fluctuating dynamical fields, but these are charges that we can explore their correlation functions. So that will tell us the spectrum of Wilson lines.
The spectrum of Wilson lines is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the representations of the group as opposed to the Lie algebra. And when we go from SUN to SUN mod ZN, what we do is throw away some of the Wilson lines. And if this sounds like Oberfolds to you, you're in the right track, and I'll make this analogy throughout the talk. The next step, we have to choose a tooth lines. The tooth lines are restricted by mutual locality, also known as Dirac quantization. And just as the Wilson lines represent probe electric particles, the tooth loops represent probe magnetic or dionic particles. So we have in mind a very heavy magnetic particle moving in space-time. And it's important to stress that the charges of these magnetic particles, does, these charges do not have to coincide with the charges of dynamical excitations. Just as the charges of Wilson lines do not have to coincide with the charges of excitations that actually exist in the spectrum, in QCD, for example, the, so the pure gauge theory, we can have a Wilson line in the fundamental. We do not have to have quarks. Similarly, we'll see here examples where we have a tooth lines with certain magnetic charges that do not correspond to dynamical magnetic particles in the spectrum. And at this point, when we make this choice of the tooth lines, we'll see that there are several dis different choices that are possible. And finally, we have a few more options when we come to consider surface operators or three-dimensional observables. So this slide was a slightly more concrete version of the previous slide. We see that to define the theory, we need to make various choices, and we'll see a little bit, we'll see now in more detail how they affect what's going on. So to keep to be even more concrete, let's focus on the special case of SU2. And I'm saying from the start, this example of SU2 captures some of the main points, but it's clearly not the typical example, as I'll show later. So let's study the Lie algebra SU2. With lowercase, it's the Lie algebra. Whoops. With lowercase, like here, it's the Lie algebra. Uppercase is the gauge group. So if the gauge group is SU2, the basic Wilson line W is in the fundamental of SU2. And we could also have powers of it, W squared, W cubed, etc. And the basic at hoofed line has integer magnetic charge. For later convenience, I'll denote it by H square. And we can have powers of it, like H to the fourth, <coughs> H to the sixth, etc., etc. So that's SU2. This is the mostly wide, most widely studied theory. Next, we can ask what happens if, there is, if the gauge group is SO3. The first difference is that we throw away W. W is no longer a valid operator, so we only have even powers of W. And as we throw away operators, we have to throw in new operators. And if it sounds like all befalls to you, we throw away some operators and we get in new ones, that's not a coincidence. So we had H square, now we no longer have H square. Sorry, we still have H square, but there could be additional operators. And Gayoto, Moore, and Nitsky pointed out that there are actually two distinct ways of adding a two of lines. The first we can call SO3 plus. The basic line that we add is H. It is electrically neutral. And the second option, SO3 minus, the basic at hoofed line is H times W. It has half a unit of magnetic charge and half a unit of electric charge. Both this line and this line are relatively local. This line and this line are also relatively local. But these two lines are not relatively local, and therefore we cannot have both of them. The upshot is that there are two distinct SO3 theories. The SO3 theory with the Wilson line, so both of them have W square, but they have different at hoofed lines. This is not something that is easily visible at the level of the Lagrangian, although I will soon show how we can see it from the Lagrangian. But there are two different SO3 gauge theories. And when we say the gauge theory is based on the gauge group SO3, we have not yet specified all the information. We also have to say what, which at hoofed lines we take into account. So this is a summary of the previous slide. We have three different theories. One is based on the gauge group SU2, and two different theories based on the gauge group SO3. And these are the allowed, li allowed lines in these theories. Now, Gayoto, Moore, and Nitsky also pointed out that the Witten effect is interesting here. Let's start, start with the SU2 theory. 
In the SU2 theory, there's a parameter theta, and if we shift it by 2 pi, we come back to the same theory. So the theory at theta is the same as the theory at theta plus 2 pi. And what the Witten effect does is to take the Etouffe line and add to it electric charge. But notice that here, that we have h square. So when we add, we're taking theta by 2 pi, we shift it by w square. That's not true here. In a SO3 theory, if we shift theta by 2 pi, we go from here to here. So we take something which has half unit of magnetic charge, we shift theta by 2 pi, and we find something that has still the same half unit of magnetic charge, but also half unit of electric charge. Therefore, the two different SO3 theories are related to each other by shifting theta by 2 pi. It is as if the theory has half instantons. Therefore, the periodicity of theta is not 2 pi, but it's 4 pi. So one way of describing it is to say that the range of theta is between 0 and 2 pi, and we have two distinct theories. Alternatively, for each value of theta. Alternatively, we can say, no, the range of theta is between 0 and 4 pi, and we don't have to bother with this index plus or minus. Well, this example is not typical. And in the typical case, this label plus and minus cannot be absorbed in, sh in extending the range of theta. So we have the range of theta covers all possible values, and there is some periodicity. And in addition, we have to keep track of these additional parameters. And I'll make it much more explicit later. OK, so this is kind of uh, just enumerating theories. Let's see how this thing affects the results of a computation. How does this affect the dynamics? So I'm going to start with the n equals 2 theory. And let's start to review the SU2 gauge theory. The SU2 n equals 2 theory has a modular space of vacua. It's the complex U plane with two special points. At this point, a monopole with magnetic charge 1 and no electric charge becomes massless. And at this point, a dion with magnetic charge 1 and electric charge 1 becomes massless. So this is all we need to know about the SU2 theory. And these two points are related by a global symmetry. So the physics here and the physics here are related to each other by a global symmetry. And indeed, if we shift theta, goes to theta plus 2 pi, these two points are interchanged. Let's see how this picture changes if all we do is change it, say that the gauge group is not SU2, but it's SO3. If the gauge group is SO3, the modular space of vacua is still the complex U-plane. And it has two singular points, a point with a massless monopole with magnetic charge 1 and no electric charge, and a point with a massless dion with magnetic charge 1 but an electric charge 1. So that part of the story is exactly the same as in the SU2 theory. However, the lines are different. And the lines are such that the SO3 plus theory has a purely magnetic Etouffe line, and the SO3 minus has a purely dionic Etouffe line. And therefore, this point and that point are really different. In the S for the SO3 plus observer, he has he or she has such a, a Etouffe line H whose charges are half the charges of this guy, and they are not aligned with the charges of this guy. For the SO3 minus observer, the basic line has half the charges of this one, and they are not even aligned with the charges of that one. So here we see very clearly that the SO3 theory does not have full 2 pi periodicity. If we shift theta goes to theta plus 2 pi, we don't come back to where we started. We come back to a new theory. Correspondingly, these two points are not related by a global symmetry. So the global symmetry relating the two vacua is absent. And the theory with theta is the same as theta plus 4 pi, which exchanges the, line, the points twice, and not the same as theta plus 2 pi. Next thing, now that we understand what happens in n equals 2, we march down to n equals 1. We take this theory, we give the gauge no a mass, and we see what the consequences are. OK, the first thing that happens is that we lose the moduli space of vacua. The monopole and the dion condense, and the theory confines. The Wilson loop, A, W, that exists in the SU2 theory, exhibits an area law signaling the confinement, and the Etouffe loop, is h square in this theory, has a perimeter law, and it's a boring operator. So that's our picture of the n equals 1 SU2 theory, two vacua related by a global symmetry. Both of them confine. W has an area law. 
Now we're going to the SO3 theory. First step, we just copy from the previous slide. We turn on a gauge genome mass, we lose the U-plane, and we are left only with the two monopole points, one, the, both of them confine, and they lead to a spectrum with a gap. So far, everything is the same. But the lines are different. So let's see what the lines do. In the SO3 plus theory, the basic line is H. Its charges are half the charge. Its charge is half the charge of the monopole that condenses. So in the vacuum where the monopole condenses, H has a perimeter law. And in the other vacuum, it has an area law because its charges are not, are not aligned with the charges of the condensing object. In the SO3 minus theory, the opposite is true. In the first vacuum, we have an area law. In the second vacuum, we have a perimeter law. In fact, the situation is slightly more interesting because I emphasize that, say, let's talk about the SO3 theory and let's look at the vacuum where a monopole condenses. The condensing monopole has charge one and the probe particle, H, has charge a half. Therefore, when the monopole condenses in this theory, it leaves an unbroken Z2 gauge symmetry. So the claim is that the SO3 theory has two vacua, not related by a symmetry. One of them is fully gapped, nothing interesting in the infrared. The other one is much more interesting. It's gapped as far as particle spectrum excitations are concerned, but not gapped in the sense that it has long-range topological order. This, when I, if you asked me a year ago what happens in SO3, this is something I would not have guessed. The theory is strongly coupled, has a gap, confines, etc., etc., but it leaves behind a topological field theory at low energies. This is something that the low energy observer can measure. It affects the number of vacua. It affects uh, correlation functions at long distance. So this is really surprising. And indeed, our friends, the condensed matter physicists, are jumping up and down about this topological phase. And now we can tell them, look, an SO3 gauge theory in four dimensions has such a phase. That's what it, it's not that it could have such a phase, it actually has that phase. Once we are done with n equals one, it's only natural to go down to n equals zero. The way we do that is we give mass to the gauge geno, we remove the gauge geno, we are left with a pure gauge theory. When the gauge geno mass is small, we have complete control over what's going on, and then we know what happens in this n equals zero theory, in this non-supersymmetric theory. We can cross our fingers that there is no phase transition as we go to very large mass and get the pure non-supersymmetric theory. And since we have to cross our fingers, what I'm going to say on this slide is only a conjecture, but it's a well-established conjecture. It's a conjecture that is one of the clay problems. And the way the clay, clay problem is formulated is that for every gauge group, there is a vacuum. The theory has a vacuum with a mass gap. So this is a good problem to solve. It's an interesting problem that is supposed to advance us if we think about it. And in fact, it does. So let's see how this problem does with our new understanding. And we start with the SU2 theory. In the SU2 theory, we have a Wilson loop W. It exhibits confinement for every theta. The periodicity of theta is 2 pi. And there are two vacua at theta equals pi. It's not a phase transition because it's the same phase on both sides but CP is spontaneously broken at theta equals pi. So this is the picture about SU2, and I still think it's correct. Now, again, without supersymmetry, let's run our SO3 story and see what happens. Again, we have two theories. For concreteness, let's focus on the SO3+. Plus. The periodicity of theta is not 2 pi, but it is 4 pi. And now we have a phase transition, a genuine phase transition at theta equals pi. For theta less than pi, H has a perimeter law, and there is an unbroken Z2 gauge symmetry. This is the surprising phase. So this is the most straightforward theory. No supersymmetry, no nothing, just pure SO3 gauge theory, as opposed to a pure SU2 gauge theory. And the difference between SU2 and SO3 is not some peculiarity that the mathemati only a mathematician cares about. Not only is it a peculiarity at the level of a lattice spacing, but it's actually a consequence at long distance. A long distance low energy observer can see this, the difference. And the statement is that the non-supersymmetric SO3 gauge theory 
has a phase theta between minus pi and pi, which has a long-range topological order. I got to say that I didn't expect that. Maybe some of you did, I didn't. And then for theta in the other range, between pi and minus pi, H has a, an area law. So this is the picture for SO3 plus. And SO3 minus is relatively easy after we understand that. All we need to do is exchange the two phases. So we've gone from n equals 2 to n equals 1 and to n equals 0. I would like now to change to n equals 4 and see what all this has to do about S-duality. And so for the next few slides, I will be in n equals 4 and see how this changes the S-duality story. So the SU2 gauge theory was analyzed by Waffa and Witten. And they pointed out that there is S-duality and SU2 is exchanged with SO3 with the transformation S. So that's part in their paper. So T shifts theta by 2 pi. S exchanges SU2 with SO3. It's also in their paper that theta, in this case, has 4 pi periodicity. I should put parenthetically that I limit myself here to spin manifolds. Otherwise, the situation is a little bit more intricate. So on spin manifolds, theta has periodicity 4 pi. They did not quite say that if we shift by t, by shift by t, SO3 plus goes to SO3 minus, but that now follows. And the other thing they could have said, but I think they didn't, is that S maps SO3 minus to itself. Intuitively, in terms of the line, it's completely clear. The Etoft line in this theory, in the SO3 minus, the SO3 minus, the Etoft line has both magnetic charge and electric charge. It's dionic. What does S duality do? It flips them. If it flips them, it keeps us in the same theory. So the way the S duality here works is like that, and you can check that ST cube equals one, etc., etc. So that is relatively straightforward, but as I said earlier, this is not typical. In general, the situation is a lot richer and much more interesting. So this is SU2. I'll give only one example for in a, of a higher group, which is more complicated. The details are not important, but I do want to convey the message that the story in general is much richer. So let's take an SON gauge theory uh, with n bigger than 3. In this case, we have this label th plus or minus, and we have two distinct theories, SON plus and SON minus, and these two theories are not related to each other by extending the range of theta. So say it again, if you compute partition, you ask how, do the instant, how are the instantons quantized in this theory, and they are quantized in units of 1. Theta periodicity is 2 pi, the way you learned in kindergarten. And we have an SON theory. You have not yet completely specified the theory. To completely specify, you also have to say what the subscript is. Is it plus or minus? Once we have that, we can start acting with S-duality. So we take this theory with n equals 4, we give it tau, and we start cranking tau up to see what we find. So here is the map, which looks like it's a bit complicated, but I'll guide you through some of that. If you don't want to pay attention to the details, they're not important, and decouple for the rest of the slide. So for concreteness, I looked at SON odd. That part is kind of standard. SON odd is mapped under S duality to SPN, and T maps us to it, the theory to itself. It shifts theta by 2 pi. So this part is completely standard. This part also looks standard. The spin group goes to SP mod Z2. This is also kind of standard. T goes to itself, and S exchanges these two theories. Now come the surprises. Number one, depending on whether the argument here is 4n plus 1 or 4n plus 3, the orbit of the modular group is different. Second, here we see new theories which depend on plus and minus. In this case, they transform to each other under, under T, and here they do not transform to each other under T. And finally, we see here a new orbit of the modular group, that if you just started from the theory you know, and crank tau up, or down to be precise, you look for weak coupling limit and you try to give them a weak coupling description, you are going to find this part, but you're not going to find that part which is in a separate orbit. So this example, which is richer than what we saw in SU2, is actually the typical situation. And what do we see here? We see that we have new theories which are not merely extending the range of theta. So it's not just that 
theta was between 0 and 2 pi, and now we are a little bit more sophisticated. We know it's between 0 and 4 pi. That's not the story. Theta is between 0 and 2 pi, but we have to keep track of another discrete parameter, this plus or minus, which is nu. We also see here new weak coupling limits. So we start from some theory we recognize. We go to strong coupling in n equals 4, and the theory there is strongly coupled, but there is a dual description which is weakly coupled, which is a gauge theory, a standard gauge theory, no strong coupling fixed point, a standard gauge theory with some Lie algebra and some gauge group, the same way we know, but the label is different. We, if we only knew about the theory with plus, we find here the theory with minus. And finally, we also saw some new orbits of the modular group. So that was telling, this whole thing is telling us that keeping track of this label is important to get the S-duality story straight. And there it really asks what happens in other situations where we have S-duality ma mapping, weak coupling, and strong coupling. So an example that is cro close to my heart is N equals 1 supersymmetry in four dimensions. It's based on the gauge group SON with matter. So this theory is dual to a theory with matter. It's dual to another SO theory with some other gauge group. And that was understood in the mid-90s. And in one case, where this argument here is exactly 2, the dual theory is SO2, which is the same as U1. And in this case, you can identify that this duality between SON and this SO is electric magnetic duality. And that was the example that motivated the name electric magnetic duality for this case. Now that we are smarter, we would like to understand electric magnetic duality in general, where we also keep track of the global part of the group. First attempt in this direction was done by Strassler. This is not quite what he says in his paper, but this is the content of his paper. He said that in this duality, if you go beyond the local structure, you should really take it as a duality that maps spin n to SO. And that, in that sense, it's kind of electric magnetic. But now we're a little bit smarter. We could ask which SO? Is this SO plus or SO minus? So the proper statement is actually this one. Spin n is mapped to SO minus, and SO n plus is mapped to itself. And you can check all the lines and a lot of paradoxes that remains from the 90s are beautifully resolved with this understanding that there are really three different theories, spin n, SO n plus, and SO n minus, and the duality works on them in this particular form. I've mentioned earlier the analogy with orbifolds. The analogy is kind of complete and is quite illuminating. So we start in, with orbifolds with some global symmetry, and then we say we gauge it. What does it mean we gauge it? We throw away all the non-invariant states. In this dictionary, this is the statement that if we start with some simply connected group, say SUN, it has some Wilson lines, and now we would like to change the gauge group to be a quotient of that, and therefore we keep only a subset of the Wilson lines, not all of them. So we throw away some operators. So this is what we do here, and that's what we do here. The next step in the orbifold is that we add the twisted sector. We add the twisted sector states, and they are restricted by mutual locality. We can't just put them at random. They have to be local relative to the states we kept and to themselves. The analogous statement here in the dictionary is that we add the toothed lines, and they are restricted by mutual locality, i.e. the raquanization. So that seems similar. In the orbifold case, we also demand, in two-dimensional orbifold, we also demand some kind of completeness. We don't just throw away states and bring in states, or throw away operators and bring in operators. We have to keep adding operators until the spectrum of operators is kind of complete. And this is implemented technically by imposing modular invariance. The same thing is true here. When we start adding these toothed lines, somebody could say, well, I don't want to add the toothed lines at all. Who forces me to add them? Well, modular invariance, modular invariance does, and the spectrum of a toothed lines has to be complete the same way it is complete here. And finally, in the case of orbifolds, once we threw away the non-invariant states, and we kept, we kept only the invariant states, and we added the twisted sector states, sometimes there is more than one way of doing it, and it comes under the name of discrete torsion. Discrete torsion is this more subtle label which tells us how to add the twisted sector states. 
the analogous statement in four dimensions is exactly our new, diff our new theories. We have different choices of at hoofed lines, and this label plus or minus, in more interesting cases, it could be a, an, an integer, kind of it has more than two values. And this is the four dimensional analog of two dimensional discrete torsion. And in both cases, we see that the crucial thing is to understand a discrete gauge symmetry. In two dimensions, it's kind of obvious. That's what we do. We gauge the global symmetry. And in four dimensions, it's the discrete group in the global part of the group. So this is the analogy with two dimensions. And this really begs the following question. I said earlier that we can think of this as either working in R4 and putting lines or surfaces by cutting parts of space-time and have non-trivial topology by that, or just have a nice, smooth, compact four manifold and ask ourselves, how do we characterize the different theories here? So in the case where we can just extend the range of theta, that's straightforward. We just extend the range of theta. The theory has half instantons, so we should extend the range of theta. But in the other cases, like in SON that I mentioned, we have distinct theories that cannot be found by just extending the range of theta. So it really asks, begs to answer the question, how do we tell a four-dimensional quantum field theory whether it is SON plus or SON minus? There must be a parameter in the Lagrangian that tells us are we in SON plus or in SON minus. Something like theta, but not theta. Well, let's review what we normally do. We start from a gauge theory, and now the configuration space splits into topological sectors, which are different bundles. Different for each bundle, we know what to do. We just sum over the configurations using the measure in the functional integral. But what about the different bundles? Well, first we have to choose the gauge group. The choice of the gauge group tells us which bundles we should discuss. In the SUN theory, we discuss some bundles. In the SUN mod ZN theory, we discuss more bundles. There are additional bundles we should discuss. And then we have to find a rule how to sum over the different bundles. So for each bundle, the functional integrals tells us what to do. And now we ask ourselves, what are the weights of the contributions of the different bundles? What we learned in school is that the standard theta angle is related to the instanton number. I'll have something to say about that in the next slide. But let's first take that at face value. So if we have two bundles that have different instanton number, we just have to multiply them by e to the i n theta and sum over them. But it sometimes happens that we have two distinct bundles, or more than two distinct bundles, with the same instanton number. I'm looking at the... Uh, with the same instanton number. What should we do here? Well, here there is another parameter we can add. It's a topological invariant, W2 square of the gauge bundle, which allows us to introduce a new parameter in four-dimensional gauge theory. Again, I was very surprised that here we are in 2013, and we find new parameters in four-dimensional gauge theories. It's a discrete theta-like parameter that should be added in four dimensions, and if we do not add it correctly, we do not get S-duality to work properly. Very briefly, I would like to mention a paper I wrote in 2010 that I'm told was totally incomprehensible, but it's closely related to this subject. We talked about extending the range of theta. I'd like now to restrict the range of theta. How can we do that? We learned in school that that's not something we can do. So we can restrict the range of theta by coupling a gauge theory to a ZP gauge theory of forms, which is represented by a scalar field phi, a compact scalar field, and a four-form field strength with a three-form gauge potential with quantized fluxes. And as we couple it to a gauge theory, we do the following. Here is our gauge theory Lagrangian, say QCD. We take our ZP sector, it's here, and we couple them with this coupling. Now, when we integrate over phi, the integral over phi comes from here and here. You see, the periods of that is one. That restricts the instanton number to be a multiple of P. So the instanton number is a multiple of p, and that means that all the bundles in which the instanton number is not divisible by p have weight zero in the functional integral. I just set them to zero. They are not there. In other words, this says that theta is identified with theta plus 2 pi over p. A canonical quantization way of saying it is that the state with theta and the state with theta over 
theta plus 2 pi over p are in the same super selection sector. We can even take p to infinity and have all the states with the same super selection sector. So intuitively, we can think of that as a discrete axion. This phi is like an axion coupling, but it acts discreetly. It identified some thetas. And if I, I don't have time to explain more, but notice that this is consistent with locality and clustering. Usually the argument in the textbooks is no n vacua. You have to be in theta vacua because the n vacua do not satisfy locality and clustering. Well, here is a perfectly local Lagrangian that I can write down consistent with locality and this restricted range of theta. So before I'm thrown off the stage, let me conclude. The global part of the gauge group is essential in defining the theory. SUN and SUN mod ZN, this is not some kind of an abstract thing that only theorists worry about. It actually has experimental consequences, measurable consequences. In addition, there, even after we pick the global part of the group, what the gate group is, there are additional choices, choices associated with the line operators, what spectrum of line operators we take, and there are distinct choices. And when we use these operators as order parameters, we find new information about the phase diagram, about the dynamics, and in particular, we found this peculiar phase, phase that we understood before, is Z2 gauge theory, but we found it in the low energy behavior of an SO3, standard SO3 non-supersymmetric gauge theory, which I find surprising. We also found new uh, results about duality of gauge theories with various amounts of supersymmetry that resolved a bunch of puzzles with the way n equals 4 works, and the puzzles are resolved by keeping track of the extra labels. And we saw that it also clarified issue with n equals 1. I did not talk about it here, but we can take all these theories, compactify them to three dimensions, and they do all these labels do marvelous things because difference in lines in four dimensions translates to difference in local operators in three dimensions because the line can wrap the circle. But I did not talk about it here. The choice of line can be described as a new parameter in the Lagrangian. Surprisingly, there are new parameters in four dimensional gauge theories. So this is a discrete theta angle. And we also showed how coupling to other topological theories, we can even change the rules about the standard theta angle. And more generally, what we see here is that we take a genuine standard local quantum field theory, couple it to a topological field theory, and get new interesting facts just from the interplay between the local theory and the topological theory. I'll stop here. Thank you. So, so Jeff. is it either inconsistent about or equivalent, an equivalence to one of the other cases if you had a theory where you just had h squared and wh? h squared? No, w the first thing, is there w or isn't there w? There's, there's no w by itself. If there's no w by itself, then what's inconsistent with what? Is there a theory where you just have operators h squared and wh? Oh, that's consistent. This is the SO3 minus. All these theories, h or w, are just modulo 2. So if... You so said, SO3 minus was w squared and hw. I'm yeah, but it also has h squared. All, all, the, all the other even powers are there. The only issue is mod, is mod 2. When so I said wh, I meant h squared, w squared, and wh, and powers of these. So the only issue is mod 2. Okay. Does, does this answer your question? Yeah, even, even in your jet lag? I managed to answer it in my jet lag state. <coughs> yep. Sorry for not being more clear on that. Does your analysis tell us anything about the standard model gauge group? Is it different from a... Sorry. Three? The spectrum of representations we know, and then there is no freedom to divide by anything else. So this is, this is the product. Actually, we do divide because the quarks have integral U1 charges and so forth. So it is the same as coming from SU5. That's a quick way of saying it. Okay. You can embed it in SU5, and it's SU5 and not SU5 mod Z5, because that would have killed the 5 and the 10 bar. So it, for the standard model, I do not see an application. For the study of abstract quantum field theory, yes, I do. Oh, so last question. Come on. Uh, do you envision or have you thoughts about, any thoughts about higher dimensional versions of the, in particular, discrete parameters for ADE 2,0 theories? Uh, I certainly did. <laughs> Well, ADE is, or the, the 2-0 is already puzzling for many reasons. 
like if you have SUN, it's not clear what you mean as opposed to UN. So it's already puzzling there, and there are different points of view about what the right attitude to this question. And well, I'll, since you asked the question, in five dimensions, you found a discrete theta parameter associated with pi 4 of SU2. So this, this is a cousin of it, except that it's different. Yeah. So this is an example of in, in high dimensions. Having said that, I would like to add that if the gauge group is disconnected, for example, ON, you can also have non-trivial W1. So you can add W1 cross w to the fourth, W1 cross W2 cross W1. And there are all sorts of other things you could do. And in four dimensions, we didn't analyze them, but in three dimensions, they lead to all sorts of marvelous things that I didn't have time to talk about, but hopefully the paper will come out soon. All right, thank you. Thank you.